Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And tonight, Sunday, May 5th, 2024, at 6 p.m., we'll begin Yom Hashoah, which will end at 6 p.m. tomorrow night, Monday, May 6th, 2024. But what's that, Brother Kenny? I've never heard of that before. Well, let me try to explain. Yom means day, and Shoah means catastrophe or utter destruction. It's Israel's memorial day of remembrance of the Jews who perished in the Holocaust. It was established in 1953. Why do I need to know that, Brother Kenny? I believe that with all that's going on in the world today, it is good to know so that you will remember what the psalmist instructed us to do. Psalm 122 verses 6 and 7. He said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. Well, give me just one good reason why I should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Just one. Well, if being instructed by scripture doesn't do the trick for you, if that's not enough, Try this on for size. Our destiny is tied to Jerusalem. We, the church, have not replaced Israel as some erroneously believe and also teach. If you read Matthew chapter 24 carefully, along with some other chapters and some other scriptures, you will see that Israel, and more specifically Jerusalem, is tied to last day events which involve us Christians, such as Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 and 16. Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 through 34. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 6. And Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24. Anyway, I would encourage you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, if for no other reason than for your own sake and for the sake of the church. But not only is it Israel's day of remembrance, but it is also Cinco de Mayo. So I want to encourage you that after this message and after praying for the peace of Jerusalem, go and enjoy some good Mexican food and happy Cinco de Mayo. And now for today's message, desperate for Jesus. There was a time when the church was desperate for Jesus, a time when even skeptics was desperate for Jesus because they saw and understood the power he possessed. I'm here today to tell you that his power has not diminished in the least bit, nor has it weakened in any way, shape or form. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. He was God. He is God and he will forever and always be God. Therefore, we should still be desperate for Jesus and even more so as we see that great day approaching. That great and awesome day of the Lord. Turn with me, please, to our scripture reading found in Matthew 14, verses 13 through 14. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. And when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Let me just set the stage for you, the scene, if you will. Jesus was in his own hometown of Nazareth, where he could do no mighty works because the people there rejected him. So he said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. What had happened was Herod had arrested John the Baptist and held him in prison. So while Jesus was being rejected in his own hometown, 
Herod the Tetrarch was celebrating his birthday. He had thrown a birthday party and the daughter of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, his niece, now his wife, Herodias, his wife, danced for him and his dinner guests, which pleased him so much that he swore to give her whatever she asked for up to half of his kingdom. Anything she asked, it was hers. She went to her mother, being a good daughter, to get her opinion. Mom, what should I ask for? Herodias, Philip's ex-wife, now Herod's wife, saw her golden opportunity to get even with John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, for rebuking Herod for marrying her. Ever since John the Baptist said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife, Herodias nursed a grudge against John the Baptist, and she was looking for an opportunity to get even. So she told her daughter, ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. Now this girl could ask for whatever she wanted, up to half of the kingdom, but her mother persuaded her to ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Talking about having your priorities in the wrong place. So she goes out and she says to Herod, Uncle, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter right now, right here. He was distressed over it. He didn't want to do it, but because of his dinner guests and because of the pledge that he made to her, he had no choice. So he promptly sent and had the executioner take John's head off, put it on a platter, and give it to the young woman. So when Jesus heard the news, he withdrew privately from there with his disciples and traveled by boat to a desolate place, a solitary place, the Bible says. But the people were hungry for the word of God. They were desperate for Jesus. All they wanted was a touch for Jesus to lay his hands on them. They were desperate for a word. They wanted their miracle. They said to themselves, I will not give up. I will not give in. I am more than a conqueror. I will have what I desire. These people were hungry for what Jesus had. And when they noticed that Jesus was leaving in a boat, they watched to see what direction that boat was heading in. And then they ran on ahead of them by foot and beat Jesus there. Look at what the Bible says. Let us turn to the Gospel of Mark. He gives a more detailed account. Mark chapter 6 verses 32 through 34. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. That event could have happened something like this. Jesus is preaching. He's teaching. The crowds are listening. And somebody comes up behind him and taps him on the shoulder. He looks around and they say privately to him. They whisper in his ear, Teacher, Herod just beheaded your cousin John the baptizer. And Jesus now stops teaching and he's thinking about this. His heart is saddened for his cousin. It could have been one of John's own disciple who came and informed Jesus. We don't know. But somebody told Jesus what had just happened. And when Jesus heard about it, he withdrew. Not that he was afraid, mind you. Not that he was concerned that Herod would do the same thing to him. But to have time to grieve for his family member and his strongest advocate. 
The people didn't know what had happened. All they knew is that Jesus was leaving. They didn't know what he was doing. They didn't know where he was going. The scriptures kind of infers that it was done privately so that they could be alone in a desolate place. The people could have taken that same approach. They could have supposed that Jesus was rejecting them and then do the same thing to him, just like his own hometown people did. They rejected Jesus and he could do no great miracles. The scripture said that people came from all the towns around, not Jesus' own hometown, but the towns around, so much so that they anticipated where he was heading and ran on ahead of him and they beat him there. When he got there, they were waiting. So when Jesus and his disciples landed, what a sight beheld his eyes. There was a huge crowd of people with their sick just waiting for him to land. So what does Jesus do? He got out of the boat and feeling great compassion for that crowd because to him they were like sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion on them and he began to heal their sick and he began to teach them many things. Now sometimes it may seem like God has left the area and he is nowhere to be found. It may seem like we are on our own, but remember God would never leave us and never forsake us. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11 verse six. And that is what these people did. They diligently sought Jesus by following him on foot and he rewarded them with healing their sick and teaching them many things. We have to understand that if we don't get offended, if we don't give up, God will let himself be found by us. Jesus will have compassion on us and heal us. He will even get involved in our personal lives and fix the problem that we have been diligently praying about. Sometimes we pray, sometimes we ask, and sometimes we seek and still it seems like Jesus has withdrawn privately. He has gone to a solitary place and we become offended. Well, Jesus ain't here in my prayers. Look, he answered her prayers but not mine. He's not answering me. And we get offended and we give up. These people could have done that same thing. They could have given up. They could have become offended. They did not though, because they were hungry for a move of God. They were desperate for Jesus. How many of us are that desperate for Jesus? How many are hungry for a move of God? How many can say, like the deer pants after the water, so my soul longs for you, O Lord, my God. Do you need healing in your body? Seek the Lord. Believe that he was wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement that brought your peace was upon him, and by his stripes, you are healed. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. Jesus paid it all. Therefore, it is yours for the asking. You know what? I would even venture to say it's yours for the taking because Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. We need to get violent in a spiritual realm. We need to get violent in our prayers. We need to get violent, begin to tear down strongholds. We need to get violent, begin to rebuke the demonic spirits that oppress us, oppress our children, oppress our family. We need to get violent in the spiritual. Because Jesus said, the violent take it by force. But back to our message. Jesus had compassion on the crowd and he healed their sick. And you know what? He hasn't changed. 
He does that same thing today. When people come in contact with Jesus, their whole world changes just like it did back then. No one back then who came into the vicinity of Jesus stayed the same way that they came. There was some type of change. Either they changed their wicked ways or they changed their bodies, meaning they were healed. They received their healing. They were no longer sick. Or they were set free from demonic oppression. But either way, there were change. A change had come. I want you to watch this video about something called the level 10 matrix. There was a scientist that I ran into, and as he began to share with me, he said, Shirley, we took a slide of cells from an 80 year old and they were jagged they were not like we would like to see in a healthy cell so they were broke down you could see the degeneration in the cells and then they took the level 10 matrix cells and they put them on the same slide not touching just within the vicinity and they could see the cells of the 80 year old begin to change shape, begin to take on the frequencies released from the level 10 matrix cells and it brought restoration, regeneration, even to the point of changing the shape and you could tell that the cells of the 80 year old were taking on the life and the frequencies from the level 10 matrix. I thought that was so extraordinary. Now, imagine that Jesus is that level 10 matrix cell and the people, including us, are the 80 year old injured cells. They put the 80 year old injured cells on the same slide as the matrix 10 cell. That cell or those cells, we're not touching each other. They were only in the vicinity of the level 10 matrix cell. And the scientists could observe a change taking place with those injured cells. The woman said that they observed the cells change shape. They began to take on a new frequency. The frequency released from the level 10 matrix cell. The level 10 matrix cell brought restoration. It brought regeneration, even to the point of changing the shape of those injured cells. She said, you could tell that the 80 year old cell was taking on the life and frequency of the level 10 matrix because there was a literal and distinct change happening. Someone once said, the religion that does not change you will not save you. That means a noticeable change must, must take place. That is what Jesus does for us. When we're desperate for him, when we get into his presence, when we begin to pray and begin to worship and begin to praise his holy name, he begins to bring a new shape in our behavior. We no longer act the way we used to act. We no longer speak the way we used to speak. There is a change. We shape up, uh, so to speak. He brings a change in our frequency, meaning we begin to hear and recognize his voice. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Jesus brings restoration, regeneration, and we take on the mind of Christ, we have a more Christ-like spirit. Jesus is the level 10 matrix that brings a total and complete restoration to our lives and to our souls. Now, look at this. As evening came on, his disciples came to him and said something like this. Look, Jesus, Jesus, the sun's going down. And this is a desolate place. There's no food here. We're getting hungry. So we know that these people are getting hungry too. 
We think you ought to wrap up your sermon now and send these people home so that they can get something to eat. It's really getting late. But instead of heeding their words, this is what Jesus says. He says something that really disturbs them. He said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat, but they have nothing to give. The only thing that they have is two borrowed fish, five borrowed loaves. Then he goes on to say something that even more blows their mind. He said, I will feed the people with these two fish and these five loaves. Have the people sit down so that they can eat. His disciples couldn't believe what it was that they were hearing. They probably began to murmur amongst themselves. How is he going to feed all these people with only two fish and five loaves? There must be 5,000 people here. But Jesus said, bring the fish and the bread here to me. You have to understand that a little is more than enough when Jesus is involved. But we have to be willing to surrender what it is that we have. The little bit that we have, we have to surrender it to Jesus. We have to offer it to him. Here, Lord, this is all I have. Do with it as you will. We may not understand. We may not be able to see, but we must trust. Because if we are obedient, and if we trust him and bring what we have to him, Jesus can and will use it and even multiply it. A little is more than enough with Jesus. Praise the Lord. And that's one of the reasons why the word says, obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than fat of rams. We just need to trust and obey. Listen, these people in our scripture reading, they were desperate for Jesus. They wanted more of him. They wanted more of what he was offering. They saw Jesus and his disciples leaving by boat and they figured out where he was headed. Then they ran on ahead of him and they even beat him there so that when he landed, they were already there waiting on him. There was no car. There was no bus, there was no horse, no donkey involved. They only had their own two feet. And you talk about hoofing it. But the only thing was, the only hoof thumping on the pounding of sandals on dirt roads. You've heard the old adage, desperate times call for desperate measures. Well, that's where these people found themselves, in a desperate situation. Jesus had withdrawn and they needed his touch. They needed and wanted and desired his teaching. They were desperate for Jesus. So they did what they had to do. They ran as hard as they could in order to get what they needed, to get what they desired. They threw dignity to the wind. They hauled up their man skirts put sandals to pavement and took off at a high rate of speed, making sure they were there before Jesus arrived. So that when Jesus got there, they would be there because they did not want to miss out on their miracle. They did not want to miss out on what Jesus had to offer. So needless to say, when Jesus got there, they were already waiting there. They had their sick with them. They did not pack a lunch though, because eating was the last thing on their minds. They were desperate. They were not thinking about food. They were thinking about what Jesus had and him leaving. They wanted what Jesus was offering. They did not have to pack a lunch. They didn't have that time. Jesus was going. So they ran on. They just ran out of their houses and ran to where he was going because they knew there's a change whenever you come into the vicinity of Jesus. They were desperate for the Lord. Can you imagine today 
if we have to drive more than 10 or 15 minutes, we're not going. And if the pastor keeps the service just a little too long and we miss lunch, we're not the first in line at Red Lobster. Well, let me just say, it ain't gonna be good. But not those people. They were desperate for a move. They came to receive. They came expecting. They wanted what Jesus had to offer. You know, I was reading a book and praying in the Holy Spirit. The author claimed that Jesus does not want us to be desperate in prayer. Lord forbid that someone would get desperate enough to cry out to God all night long in prayer. Or that someone would come in desperation, weeping and asking and seeking the face of God. But that's only his opinion. I, however, beg to differ. Look at Lamentation chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. Their heart cried to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the night watches, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Now, does that sound like desperation is lacking anywhere in there? I don't think so. But someone will argue, oh, Brother Kenny, that's the Old Testament. That has nothing to do with us. Okay, okay. Let's flip forward then a few books to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 5. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending, after the Passover, to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Herod laid violent hands on some of the Christians, including John's brother, James, whom he killed with the sword. He also laid hands on Peter as well, whom he imprisoned and guarded by four squads of soldiers, making sure that Peter would not escape. He planned to kill Peter after the Passover, just like he had killed James. But, the scripture says, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. See, Herod's plan was to kill Peter, but because he saw that killing James had pleased the Jews. So, he was planning on killing Peter as well. But earnest prayer was made for Peter. Desperate intercession went up to God for Peter. Herod and the Jews had one plan, but the church had a different plan. Their plan included or involved Jesus. Free Peter. Save Peter's life, O Lord, our God. That was their desperate plea in earnest prayer. This word earnest is the Greek word ektenos. It means eager, continuous. So it's eager, continuous prayer. In other words, they were desperate. I'm not talking about a little five minute, if it's your will, dear Lord, type of prayer. This was an all night prayer, an all day prayer, crying out to God for his mercy on Peter type of prayer. The Christians praying for Peter were desperate for a move of God. They had just made the mistake of not praying for James in a desperation. And James paid the ultimate price. He was executed by Herod. So, they were determined not to make the same mistake. 
And that's why Peter fared so much better. Why? Because of the prayer of desperation. Think about those two blind men that Jesus healed as he was leaving Jericho. They cried out in desperation. Even though the crowd rebuked them and told them to shut up, they cried out even more. The Bible says they cried out all the more. And here is what Jesus did. Matthew chapter 20, verse 32 through 34. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Because of their cries of desperation, Jesus stopped, called them, and gave them what they asked for. The same with the Syrophoenician woman who would not give up, even though Jesus ignored her, even though he refused her at first. But because of her desperate faith, she went home with what she wanted. She got what she came for. Don't tell me that God does not want us desperate in prayer. God does not want some soft, belly aching, neo pagan pretender as a soldier. God wants a tried in the fire, purified in the crucible, spiritually tough soldier who is not afraid to get his hands dirty, not afraid to get her hands dirty, or to suffer a few bumps, a few bruises for the sake of the gospel. God is looking for a few good soldiers who are desperate enough to stand the test. What about you? Are you desperate for Jesus? Have you made him your Lord and your Savior? If you haven't, you can today. He loves you. He cares for you. All you have to do is to come to him, confessing your sins and asking for his forgiveness. And you know what? He will receive you with mercy. He will give you his forgiveness. He will take you and make you his own. Come, be desperate in your prayer and Jesus will receive you. He will hear you and he will answer that prayer of desperation. If you're ready to join the Lord's army, if you're ready to receive Jesus as commander in chief, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me my sins. I ask you, Lord, to make me strong. Help me to be desperate for you. Lord, that whatever I need to do to get your attention, wherever I need to go to receive, help me to have the strength, the knowledge, and the wisdom to do it, to go. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for receiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins, and he will cleanse you from all uncleanness, and he will make you a child of God. What I want you to do now is to get a Bible, whether it's off your bookshelf or whether you gotta go out and buy one, but get a physical Bible. Read your Bible. Get a highlighter. Highlight those verses. Learn those verses. Memorize those verses so that when the enemy comes in, you can use those verses against them. Times of trouble, when you're down, read those verses. They will encourage you. Pray those verses. Next thing I need you to do is to find a Bible-believing church, one who believes in the power of God, one who's, who believes in righteousness and in holiness, not one of those wayward churches who embraces the world and, and, and goes as the world goes. No, get one of those churches who believes, thus saith the Lord, who believes in a right way and in a wrong way. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. Be faithful. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy. Remember, 
Next week, next week Sunday, is Mother's Day. Join us for our Mother's Day message. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and 